Beatles, Bowie, Devo, Grammys, Cleos. You're about to learn from a master. We've got a new ITL. You're at the place, Pensado's place. What's up, guys? Man, it's been a good week. Wait, wait, wait. Will you please say yay? I did. No, you didn't hear it. Say it again. Yay. Okay, good. Um, I'm confused. Am I supposed to say it now? We'll work out the timing in practice. <laughs> We're losing time for Ken Scott. <laughs> um, golly, I lost my train of thought. Um, uh, it was a good week. It was? Yes. What made it a good week? Man, uh, thanks for that, Herb. That was really genius. Uh, my, my, you guys, remember Bobby Ozinski was on the show a few weeks back, and Bobby invited me to do a podcast with him. It's called Audio Now Cast. And uh, I had a great time. It was like eight engineers, all from different, different uh, genres. Mm -hmm. Gen genres? Very good. Genre. Genres. And um, we, just had a, we just had a great time. Rob Arbiter, Mike, Mike Rodriguez was the moderator. Bobby, of course, was there. Uh, Scott Gershon. Gershon, Diego Stacco, uh, Brandon Bernstein, and Bobby Summerfield. Um, if you get a chance, look that up. Um, I, think, I, think, I think you'll learn a lot from it, especially you'll learn some alternate ways to earn a living with these skills that we're imparting to people. Good deal. Um, as usual, let's say hello to our Vintage King family. Hey, Vintage King family. We've got Jason Cropper. He is in the chat room. Has Jason been there before? No, Jason's brand new, and you can see his information up on the screen. Jason's all stud-like posing in his picture. All ask, right, Jason, ask, welcome. Ask, ask, ask Jason how to determine the difference between a 550A with the cool op amp and a, and a fake. That's a good question for Jason. That should get him started. And Jason is in the chat room. It's which is man, but of course our man Drew Adams. Say hey, Drew. What the deal? <laughs> okay. Bonix 101. And Drew did a remix. It's incredible. You gotta I, hear this. I understand he did. Um, let's get our homework stuff out of the way because we have such a great guest and a new ITL. There's our homework page Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. You know that. Also, don't forget, go to our website for more information and other stuff. And we're going to be doing some interesting things there. That's pensadosplace.tv. You see that going by on the screen. Now we got our homework out of the way. We got a new ITL. We got good stuff. Why don't we get to it? Uh, ITL? Yep. Yeah. Um, man, ITL this week is self explanatory. Uh, I've, I've just been using a couple pieces of gear that I just wanted to share with you. Um, I mean, this, this is an unpaid endorsement with these things, but um, I found them both kind of unique and both kind of cool. So, Will, you want to run that? Oh, you're back there today. <laughs> uh, usually you're over here. Hey, guys. I uh, woke up this morning, um, decided I would cruise the Internet a little bit before I uh, got my day going, drinking my coffee, went over to Vintage King and ran into a couple of my uh, old buddies, metaphorically speaking, and I uh, decided uh, I looked at the Shadow Hills uh, equipment and, uh, man, I have fallen in love with this compressor, the Optograph uh, 500. And uh, I, I quickly showed you a couple of things, and over the last couple of months, I've kind of delved into it pretty heavily. And sometimes I don't use outboard gear because it's it's it's, it's uh, I have to you know recall it and all that kind of stuff. But but I'm going to show you two pieces of gear today that are that have detents and they're very easy to recall, and um, they just work and they give you another color that you can't get in the in the in the plug-in world. Um, so let's start with the Shadow Hills. Uh, I'm going to play a, a Snoop vocal that I mixed from my buddies uh, Addis and Monster Blocks. I've got these guys on uh, the outboard gears on a hardware insert, but depending on what equipment you're using, it'll be pretty much the same. Uh, I'm going I'm to use this little section here. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. I'm here to play. Enjoy your day. Hey. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Duck. Okay, so I'm going to take this compressor off. Now, I, I'm taking a little bit of... Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. I'm here to play. Enjoy your day. Uh, on another passage, it's, it's taking out a little mid-range. Here's my Shadow Hills right here. And 
uh, DS are just knocking off a little bit. Tiniest bit of EQ up here, 1 dB. Let's just leave that for now. That's more repair EQ rather than make it sound good EQ. Um, I've got uh, on output 1, I've got the left side of the MOG EQ. It's not in. It's bypassed right here. In the Shadow Hills is bypassed right there. Let's, let's start with the Shadow Hills. Let's start with the Shadow Hills. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. I'm here to play. Enjoy your day. Hey. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. I'm here to play. Enjoy your day. Hey. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. I'm here to play. Enjoy your day. Hey. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. I'm here to play. Enjoy your day. Hey. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. I'm here to play. Enjoy your day. Hey. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. What we've done is we've taken some of the little louder parts and we've trimmed those back a little bit. And then we've taken our gain and we've made, uh, pulled the gain up. So now it feels like Snoop's just more in your face. And we're getting a little bit of color from the Transformers. This thing has very expensive transformers. Uh, it's, it's an opto uh, detector circuit, uh, LA-2As. There are several compressors that do this, and all of them give you a, a color of their own. And um, um, I happen to like this color because it has a more modern vibe to, 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 to it than some of the older gear. But uh, check this out. We'll do some ABs. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. I'm here to play. Enjoy your day. Hey. In. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. I'm here to play. Enjoy. Okay. Now, one thing we can do with this, uh, and, and I, I, I think it's going to sound better. We can, in the detector circuit, uh, the, the circuit that the compressor makes a decision about when to do its compression, we can insert a, a filter. Um, a high pass filter so uh, Snoop's got a little low end Let, let's let's have a little bit less of that in his voice um, control the compressor check this out ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub I rock to get enough you got to give it up I'm here to play enjoy your day hey ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub I rock to get enough you got to give it up I'm here to play enjoy your day hey ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub I'm doing it at 150 hertz, so everything below 150 hertz is not controlling the detector. Uh, I, I'll grant you that it is a little bit subtle what you're hearing, but uh, uh, it's not so much what you're hearing that you can learn from, but the concept of using that in the detector circuit you can learn from. Um, I, I love that. So let's let's start with that. Now, there's another circuit that, that's fairly unique to this. Um, he calls it a, a desaturate circuit. It gives you, think of it this way without getting too technical, it gives you the best of the, tr of, 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 of the sounds of the electronics like the transformers, but it doesn't give you the negative elements. So this is without it. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub, I rock to get enough, you got to give it up. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub, I rock to get enough, you got to give it up. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub, I rock. I hear it mostly in the high frequency information, the clarity of that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do one time without it. Then the second pass will be with it, and, and on both passes, focus on the high frequency information, the S's, that sort of stuff. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. I, I love what that adds. It, it's it's subtle. It just helps me understand the, the vocals a little better, and it helps me. Um, I don't know. I just like it, man. Believe me. All right, now let's play with a little bit of EQ, okay? We'll leave that in, and we'll put uh, we'll put the EQ after it. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Okay, there's some nasalness going on there. Um, I'd like to have a little bit of clarity on the very top end, and I'm hearing a little bit of mid-range I don't like, and there's something on the low end that's bothering me, so let's attack it. 
Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. I'm taking a little bit of 600 out. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Taking a little bit of 100. Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You. Okay, I'm gonna try something. I'm gonna exaggerate the EQ so that you can hear the frequencies I'm working with. The boost, I'm gonna boost more. The cuts, I'm gonna cut more. Okay, let's try it. Without it. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. Ladies love Snoopy Deagle Dub. I rock to get enough. You got to give it up. So uh, I think that was instructive. You saw where I was boosting a little easier, and you saw where I was cutting because obviously in the mix we, we do it a little more subtle. If you got any questions, hit me up on Facebook. Uh, uh, but like you guys know how much I love plugins, so when I show you a piece of outboard gear, it's got to be really special because I'm too lazy to to have to deal with this. You know, changing mixes three times a day and changing all these settings. But both of these are very, very easy to get to your exact settings because everything is detent. Two good pieces of gear, uh, Peter Reardon and Cliff Mogg, two really good guys. All right, hasta mañana. Hope you got something out of that. Um, like I said, uh, uh, like I do every ITL, s s transcend and, and, and just use it as concepts that will apply to a lot of things. It, some of the things I showed you aren't specific to that compressor or that equalizer. I just wanted you to see how uh, I used a couple of pieces of gear. By the way, uh, I was told not to say this, so I'll say it anyway. Um, I was cruising around the Vintage King website, and uh, I think they got a couple of demos that you might want to check out the price of on those if, if you're interested. But um, Man, Ken Scott is our guest today, and um, um, it, it's a real pleasure for us to get, get to spend some time with him. Uh, not only has he done a lot of your favorite records, but if you name an artist, he did their coolest records. I we'll have to find out how Ken was, was able to do that. I mean, he just doesn't have a dog on his resume, oh, <laughs> unlike me. Um, <laughs> But Ken, welcome and thank you so much for I'm being so, here. Man, I'm so I, pleased is, to be here. Welcome aboard. Finally. Uh, Very cute. I, I, I can't wait. I got a million questions and. Uh, uh, and I've got a hundred answers. <laughs> and uh, he's got this thing, G O M. We'll, we'll figure out G O M oh, later, Herb. No. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Let's just jump right into it, man. Um, Epic drums. Have you been working on that most of your adult life? It That's seems quite like an undertaking. It. I mean, just yeah. the level of people that are helping you with this and and explain what it is. It, it's computer software, basically drum drum software, uh, which I got together with five drummers that I've worked with in the past: mm. Woody Woodmansey from from Bowie Spiders from Mars, Bob Seidenberg from uh, Super Tramp. Rod Morgenstein from Dixie Dregs, Terry Bozio from Missing Persons, and Billy Cobham from Mahavishnu Orchestra and his solo albums. Yeah, 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 yeah. second-rate yeah, musicians, yeah, but no big deal. I got them cheap. So. Yeah, one of the first a Billy Cobham I mean, story for you. So, so oh, okay. what happens with well, them? Well, uh, got together with them and worked in studios that had Trident A-Range boards because at some point or another I'd worked with Trident A-Range with each of the, the guys. And we recreated the sounds that we got uh, on the records we worked on together. Uh, first off was, was matching up studios acoustically to how mm. it was for them. Uh, then it was getting the, 
getting the right drum kits because we, we needed what we had back then. Mm -hmm. and we got 95% of the way there. Cobham's was the hardest because Fives had gone out of business, so it became really hard. Bozio was the easiest because he still had the kit that he had with missing persons, oh, the wow. Rototom kit. Right. So they were the, the originals. Then it was getting the same mics, which were costly these days. And when in the studio, we had them play along with the record and they matched up the sounds. Then we just had them play along with the record so that we could get them, get grooves from the record, like two or four bar, bar grooves that people can use. Then we just had them jam, so there's, there's more stuff there. Wow. Uh, so it's, it's available with, it has the, the sample sounds for anyone that uses electronic kits or just programming that way. And there are grooves with it, all in multi-track uh, format. Wow, amazing. And, uh, yeah, it's been tough. I bet. Long time. Yeah. Guys, uh, I'm going to take a look, quick second here. Uh, Ken did uh, Magical Mystery Tour for the Beatles and the White Album. He's got some... Google his name. He's got a great story about Ringo Starr working on back in the USSR. Jeff Beck Truth, which was an album that changed my guitar playing life. Uh, the coolest of the Bowie albums, Ziggy Stardust, Duran Duran, their best records, All Things Must oh. Pass, George, 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 uh, what were you going to say, Jim? I was, well, with, with uh, Duran, I, I have the unique honor. I, I quite often, ha records I've worked on are quite often in like the top 10 or top 20 records of all time, yes. century, whatever. Pretty, pretty consistent. But I also happen to have the worst record of all time, uh, <laughs> according to Q magazine in England, and that was one of the Duran albums. Is that so, right? Yeah. That's Voted ridiculous. the worst record ever. That's, That's so what I love about you, Key, and only you would bring that up. <laughs> That's great. I love that. Uh, Elton John, Man, Man across, across the Water, Hockey Chateau, Don't Shoot Me. On, oh, man. Mm. A record that, 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 that's a little more on the obscure side that I, I kind of changed me for a little bit it was Linda's Farm. That was a great well, record. Yeah. I, lo I love that record. It was straight. Some of the that musicianship was with, on that. That was with Bob Johnson producing and it was this one tries to learn from everyone one works with and with him it was strange because all he did was sat there and he hardly ever said anything and he'd roll joints every now and again and hand them out <laughs> to the band. But he, f there was something about him that just brought out the best in the band and the best in me. And wow. it was, it, I've never That's quite been able record. to. That's a record yeah. that couldn't be made today. No, absolutely not. Uh, Although uh, it did get, we did get, I think it was one number one and one top ten single over in England with it. Yeah. So it, it was successful the over there. Relative power of the canvas that was being handed out. <laughs> 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 well, it's, it's Pavlovian. You, you do good, you get a joint. <laughs> yeah, I didn't smoke. I didn't smoke any of it, so it doesn't count for me. Why me? But the band was. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Was baked. <laughs> okay, uh, man. I, Pink Floyd, uh, Rolling Stones, um, Lou Reed, the cool album, uh, <laughs> Let Me Walk on the Wild Side. I mean, I got a million questions about the bass parts on that. Um, I mean, Stanley Clark, Level 42, Devo, uh, Super Tramp. Super Tramp, a lot of people have, have missed those records, but those are, those are some of the most well-crafted records ever in the history of music. There was a... a there was a freedom and a lack of corporate involvement on those records that I'm not sure we could ever make in, in, records like that again. Talk, talk. Interestingly enough, that was the f that the crime of the century was the first time I'd ever actually sort of had a member of a record company come by during the recording, mm -hmm. and it, it was pretty terrifying for us because we, for whatever reason. I don't know what was going through our heads at the time, but we decided to, to be very careful right from day one. And like I spent a day and a half, I think it was the first day and a half, just getting the drum sound. And it continued that way. And two, two weeks in, we'd got basic tracks down, but no overdubs yet mm -hmm. and all that. Suddenly we get a phone call from A&M that Jerry Moss, the M of A&M, is Absolutely. in town Absolutely. and uh, wants to come by and hear what we've done. And we thought, oh, oh, crap, God. no. Because uh, uh, records back then were being... The complete thing was oh, done in two weeks. I mean, yeah, he'd, he'd it was. It was too. And so, he came down and uh, we played him what we had. And in typical record company fashion, he gets up at the end, no smile or anything. Just thank you very much, very nice, very nice. And we thought, oh God, that's it. It's all over. We heard back the next day. He true. loved it. Yes, true. anything we wanted, we we had. So th yes, there was corporate involvement, but it was the good side of it that mm. gave us the freedom, which was great. Um, Guys, 
I'm not going to spend a lot of time with the anecdotes because uh, Ken is, is, but please tell any you want. Dude, I love them. I live for these. Um, I will stay here until the electricity runs out. Uh, but um, uh, he's got a book coming out this summer, early summer, called uh, Abbey Road to Ziggy Stardust. No, yeah, Ziggy, Abbey Road to Ziggy Stardust, recording Ziggy the Beatles, Abbey. Bowie, and all that jazz. Yeah, and, and, it's, and it's, I'm told that it's just it's just packed full of, of anecdotes. If you love the artists that I mentioned earlier, I'm I'm pretty sure Ken has included incredible stories. Uh, hopefully today we'll have have time to hear the, the the Ringo Starr quitting story. I love that story, but but um, one of the things I like about you is your your concept that. Analog, digital, there's 52 cards in the deck and you're going to play poker, use them all. Don't, yeah. don't say aces count for you but not for me. And, and, and you're, you're very comfortable in, in both worlds and you just pick and choose whatever you feel is best for the moment. I, it's, it's just so refreshing. And, and, and you made a sentence that, that digital is getting to the point where you can kind of get some analogness out of it now. Well, yeah, you, you can, but the, it's still not all the way there yet. Eventually it will, in my humble opinion, it will eventually get to the point where there is no difference. But at this point in time, there still is. There is, for me, there's a harshness to digital that isn't there, there's, that isn't there on analog. The warmth isn't there yet. Uh, but there are things that you can do digitally that you can never do analog. And there are things the other way. I, I was in the studio just the other day and it, we wanted to uh, emulate something I'd done in the past uh, to do with uh, speeding up of vocals and to get the effect, the actual effect of recording, the, having the tape running slower, recording, mm -hmm. and then playing it back faster so it's more chipmunky. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to do that digitally. Mm -hmm. The whole thing of backwards reverb, it's mm -hmm. a hell of a lot easier just taking up the tape, turning it over, recording the reverb and putting it back. You've got it. Tools 10, you can do it now in one step. Well, oh, you can? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Because um, last time I tried it, it was no, really tough. Not, I'm not even sure it's out yet. Oh, okay. This, this goes along with your sentence that uh, your concept that modern technology has has made it easier to record, but not necessarily easier to make great music. Uh, I, expand on that. It's, a it's bit. almost made it harder because people won't make decisions these days. It, it, I grew up. My my very first sessions as an engineer were on four track, and we had to make the decision right up front that the finished product was going to sound like this because we were mixing together bass, drums, guitars, maybe piano, all on one track and then just overdubbing from there. We had to decide then and there Pro it was going to be like that. Whereas, make no I know, so what happens is that people will go through, well, I don't think it will work, but maybe we should keep it just in case later on down the line we find a place for it. And then when it comes time to mix, it will take three weeks because you're just sort of, well, does this work? Well, I don't know. Maybe it will work if we have this in. No, it doesn't. Maybe it will work if we have this in. Uh, just no one will make it, up it, their bloody mind. But it's the same. You, it, it's a humankind thing. It's not just mm -hmm. with making records. You go to a blockbuster or supermarket. How many times have you walked down the aisle and there's a guy on the phone and it's, hey, honey, they've got about 20 different kinds of baked beans. Now, what kind is it I should get? They're Goddamn baked beans, just make a decision and get one. That's the gum, by the way. That's the grumpy old man. <laughs> it's, um, um, I'm guessing here, but a lot of the things, like, by the way, there's a great interview with, uh, or actually Ken is moderating a forum on, gen, on gear sluts, and once again, uh, Jules, uh, kudos to him. It's really excellent. You can learn a lot about how, how Ken thinks. You can, uh, tons of little anecdotes about different things. And one of the things I'm noticing from having read the, that interview is that a lot of the what people would call the negative elements of having to commit and make a decision were things that everybody wanted to know how you did it because they were uniquely wrong at the time but became the one memorable thing about that record you know what i'm saying yeah. I mean, wrong is the is the incorrect word but but when you commit you 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 learn to work around certain things and, and, and amplify the strengths of it and, and a lot of the uniqueness of of your big hits have come from just committing to to a sound well as i say back then we were making re uh, an album in in two weeks we had to be complete because artists back then, it was two albums every year. It's not the three years that we, we get nowadays. So you only had a short period of time. So you had, apart from 
anything, uh, just the limitations of four or eight tracks. Mm -hmm. you, you didn't have the time. So, yes, that's good. We're moving on. And there, there is, because you're doing it so fast and making the decisions on the fly, there's a humanness to it. These, these days, it's all on the grid. Everything yeah. has to be on the grid. And it loses click all of the human feet. Or... No, uh, click tracks are fine. I've used click tracks since uh, yeah, you speed about up the early, early 80s. You speed up the that's, courses, that's you, the take, difference. you make your click tracks move. Yes, that, that's the difference. Because it, uh, the drummer will o always, in a live situation, speed up when you, come to the, yeah, when you come to the chorus. We're it adds the excitement yeah, to it. Course. And that's what's lacking when it's just all the same throughout. You miss, you miss humanity. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you this, Ken, and, and, Music is human. Yeah, yeah. It, it, would be Pens it wouldn't be Pensado's place without a smart-ass question, but <laughs> in those days, you never thought records would be around in 40 years. You were making records to last six months. Yeah. If you knew that... If you knew then what you know now that these things are being studied and scrutinized 40 years later, would you have committed less? <laughs> no way. Right. Exactly, the, exactly the I same. I knew you were going to say yeah, that. Of course. I, wanted to, I just wanted to say that because uh, sometimes when, when I make a commitment, it goes through my mind. This, this could be around to haunt me forever, but screw it. This but is it, what I believe yeah. in. But it's, it's that thing. We weren't making records, music for anyone else we were doing it for ourselves and if other people liked it that's the icing on the cake mm. it's uh, so if we felt good enough about it that we could live with it then there would be nothing to change you've got a uh, a small reputation for enjoying loud music as have as, I? yes wow yes. you like you Surprising. like to monitor kind of loud I've heard that from some people yeah <laughs> mind you once I started to work with Duran and uh, realized how loud John Taylor likes to monitor things. Even I had to walk out. It oh, was wow. unbelievable. Was it really? But, oh, Def Con straight four. over. Boom, turn it forward. John was the bass player? Yeah. Great bass player. Yeah. Oh, power Station. God, what a yes. great group. Did you, did you work on any of No, no. Wow. Um, another thing that you and I have in common is, um, well, man, let's just tell it like it is. I hate demos. Yeah. Um, there's, there's something limiting about and insulting about restricting what a, a person with your creativity and, and myriad of ideas that you bring to the party, and all of a sudden you get limited by something that was accidentally put together and has no bearing on reality other than it was around long enough to like. Well, well yeah, one of the problems with, with demos is demoitis. It's mm -hmm. you get so caught up with one thing that's in the demo and you've got to recreate that. And when you're in the real studio doing the real thing, that's not. Yeah. It's not always the I've way. I've fallen in love with my own I've, demos sometimes. Yeah. How do you get but, rid but of I've, that? I've also gone through a situation with Level 42, the album I did with them. It, that was one of the hardest albums I've ever done because not all of the material was written up front. We'd go in and they would just groove. Mm. And once they found something they liked, okay, then Mark King, the, uh, the bass player and singer, he then do something over the top of it that he wanted to sing vocally and then the lyrics would go. But that whole thing, I, I had no idea what it was going to be in the end. Mm -hmm. And that made it really hard, because I like to have some idea of what it's going to be going that. in. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. So you're just going on the fly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't work my best that way. So. Yeah, you worked with America, too? Yeah, I did their first album. I think so I had the good album. I had that, yeah, I didn't record that track. That was added on afterwards because I, of uh, the... Warner Brothers, I think, the record company didn't hear a single. Nothing but. will send me faster into Nirvana and have me do every lyric like those songs. But they're, they're getting a star on the Hollywood Walk of oh, Fame that's next, next week. It and they're also just... giving a uh, performance and talk at the Grammy Museum. Oh, Tuesday fantastic. Night, which is great. Oh, cool. um, I found this fascinating. Uh, it's fun to speculate. Nobody knows for sure. But you speculated that if John Lennon were alive today, he'd use auto-tune. Yeah. Once. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. And there was this pause. It's like, John Lennon would use auto-tune. Once. <laughs> but that says a lot for, for, for Lennon, doesn't it? Well, it's, he wanted to try everything. And he was one that would make decisions as to whether it worked or not instantly. Mm. Uh, and that includes... In the talks that I give to, to colleges and universities, whatever, one of the things that I push is that mistakes can be good because that's something else that's disappeared mm -hmm. these days. If it's not perfect, you cut and paste until it is or auto-tune or whatever. And 
That's there there were ver there, yeah, there were various times when, uh, as an example, I erased some snares when I was working on the White Album. Mm. And oh, I yeah. heard that story. Oh, by the book. Are we getting into, <laughs> no. are we getting into legal implications <coughs> here? I mean, you got to pay any money back or anything? No. Okay, no, just, just no. checking. But uh, I yeah, erased. Keep in mind, right, Phil? <laughs> I I erased a bunch of snares, and. Uh, John was standing right beside me, and it was one of those horrific moments of, this is it, I'm out on my ear kind of thing, and John heard it. You know what? We just come out of the biggest part of the song into the smallest, into that part, and suddenly it goes really small. No one would ever think of that. It's perfect. We'll keep it. Love just it. straight oh, off yeah. like that. And it, it, Which song was that? Uh, Glass Onion. Wow. Were you around their creative process while they were writing, or was it just recording? No, I think that, generally speaking, they had this, uh, well, the writer of the song had the, the song together before sure. they came in. Gotcha. This would be a good uh, time to often. tell the, uh, the story where Ringo... Well, it's just Ringo quit the band. He, he, he was fed up. He didn't feel wanted, I think, is the way he describes he it. He just had days. to sit around a lot while everybody else yeah. worried. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he quit, and during that period of time, we recorded, at Abbey Road, we recorded uh, back in USSR, which finished up with Paul laying down the initial drum track. Then it wasn't completely right, so then John and George jointly played The same drums. drum kit at the same time. Yeah. yeah One played kick and snare, and the other played cymbals. Yeah, right? something like that. And uh, then we mixed it all together, and that's the final drum track. And uh, Without Ringo? Without Ringo. Which makes me, uh, it, on, what is it, uh, the Beatles rock band or whatever it is, they, they just on the, the picture that they've got for that, there's Ringo behind the drums on it, and he weren't there, Danny, you should have known that. But uh, no, he came back to, a couple of weeks later, he came back to a studio full of flowers that George had organized, just covered the With entire place. With a big place. welcome back, yeah, Ringo yeah, sign. It was amazing. Let me ask you something about the Beatles. Um, I'm a big Beatles fan. I'm not as big a Beatles fan as a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, because of my age and my generation, I'm chosen as a spokesperson to defend the Beatles' contribution to music among 20-year-olds. Mm -hmm. And uh, like that one back yeah. there. And, I know and how old. do you do that? How, I mean, you were there. Yeah. I mean, you know the contributions they made <coughs> to music. How can you explain that to 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 someone that didn't, because in order to really fully understand what they contributed, you, you had to know the state of music when they came mm -hmm. along. Well, and, how, how do you explain uh, what Alexander Fleming did for, for medicine with the mm -hmm. discoveries that, that he came up with? It, it's, if you weren't there, you, it, it's harder to accept it. Mm -hmm. But if it weren't for the Beatles, recording technology, number one, wouldn't be as far along as it is now. Mm. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Uh, phasing, automatic double tracking, flanging, th th just so many different things that, that we had to do. Uh, running of two four tracks together, which w was a bit of a disaster when we tried it back then, but it, it did Was Sergeant work. Pepper really done on, on a four track? F yeah, Sergeant Pepper was four track, yeah. Wow. As was. Magical Mystery Tour, as was half of uh, the White Album. You got to make a few commitments when you do that, oh, don't yeah, you? Oh yeah, absolutely. But 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 pretend like I'm 20 years old and I'm like, I much prefer what Timbaland does than what the Beatles do. Why should I listen to the Beatles? Because radio wouldn't be what it is today to allow someone like that to be played. Uh, probably. <sighs> I hate to say it, but I don't think black music would be as appreciated as it is today. Uh, I know within, within England, uh, Tamla Motown wouldn't have been as big without the Beatles pushing it. They were because they, shone a, they shined a spotlight on it Absolutely. in a way that had never been done before. Absolutely. And th their covering of, of a lot of, of black acts and the Chuck Berry songs and all of that kind of thing, they, they pushed that further forward, at least in England. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot more very rich pop stars thanks to what went on with the Beatles, with merchand merchandising being given away and all of that kind of thing. That, no one knew about that, really. They obviously to a point, but they, what happened with the Beatles with all of that kind of thing, just, it went up, 
it was unbelievable and no one knew quite how to handle it Brian Epstein especially and just giving it all away now yeah, it's yeah. you want that you've got to pay big for it mm -hmm. kind of thing uh, and I know just me, excuse me I didn't mean to cut no. you off I know for me sometimes uh, taking that whole scenario and, 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 and relating it to engineering skills what if I was a young engineer what would you tell me that I should I, I, I owe the Beatles and, and and for me sometimes when I I'm not blessed with a very clear reference in my head so sometimes when I'm working on a song or a mix I have to listen to something and kind of get my bearings mm -hmm. again and then I go okay I see what I'm I see my flaws now and I find myself using a lot of their recordings as the essence of what something should sound like like their piano sounds for example especially the piano at Trident which had that oh that, that was, that was probably yeah, the world's greatest piano with more hits than anything Sometimes, well, greatest rock piano. Sometimes that that that's my. I have to go back and make, make and listen to that when I'm working on a piano. Mm -hmm. Their string sounds prior to that were or, orchestral, but they used them in a rock context. They made mm -hmm. rock string parts. Yeah, and, and just on and on and on. Um, some of the drum sounds uh, hold up for me pretty good. Some of them but, don't. No, but what you what one of the th the great things about them you're you're saying possibly without even thinking about it but they're constant changing yeah of things that yeah. right from uh, norman smith the engineer that did the first six i think it was the first six albums with them uh it it's not t very obvious but he certainly made changes uh, sound-wise with each album that he worked on with them he he changed a lot of things as it moved on between the very first one and rubber soul then when Jeff came on board uh, for revolver and and sergeant pepper it was absolutely astounding the leaps forward that happened and it was a combination of new blood being brought in that were that wasn't old school so was more willing to make changes mm -hmm. and the, the Beatles wishing to experiment more and just grow even bigger than than they were musically just all came together at the right time tell, tell and it you just think, did things that would never have happened tell me if you think this is an accurate statement it seems like in the course of my lifetime there's been two periods of time where the technology available to our profession has grown a little quicker than other times the first growth was that time period when the Beatles came along and they not only embraced the speed with which technology was changing, multi-track recording, all that kind of stuff, better consoles, better everything. They not only embraced uh, but, that, but, but if, if the technology was here, they were right with it. And then nowadays is the second time period where technology mm -hmm. is really advanced with the digital thing, but the artists of today aren't chasing it and using it as efficiently as the Beatles did back then is that something we can learn from them well I would argue to a point with what you just said because the majority of their their recordings were done on gear that had been at Abbey Road since well before they ever set foot in there so they weren't really grabbing on to modern growing technology they were tending to force us at Abbey Road to, to do things with the technology that we had at the time take it further than it had ever gone before so to a point if, if you take technology as being there they were slightly ahead of it the entire time oh, pulling us along with them with regard to the the technology of today the digital stuff how many plugins are emulations of the old gear yeah. a, a, a tremendous amount yeah. of them yeah. it's still we're almost behind what happened back then because we're still trying to copy what we had back then a lot of it and mm -hmm. with re it, it a lot of it's being overused yeah i, it, yeah. I think uh, this is a side thing but i think one of the reasons that that takes place where where there's so many different 1176 plugins mm -hmm. is because it, there's a comfort to walking up to the plug-in you already know how to use it because you been exposed to 1176 mm -hmm. and then there's plugins uh, some of the MacDSP plugins that do the same exact thing but they don't look like an 1176 so our minds don't think of them as being as good as an 1176 and they're better yeah. there's something about emulating things that exist in the real world in the plug-in world that sells a lot of plugins sure. but having said that you and I both agree that the UAD plugins have done a remarkable job of capturing yeah, a lot of absolutely. the essence the ways plugins I think are Incredible. Also, um, very good question. The 
working with Bowie, yeah. th how was that from a technical standpoint? It, it seemed, he seemed like a guy who, from the outside, he, he lived his art. He sort of... Oh, did he have a... <laughs> right? And, well, and, yeah. And he, as an he, engineer, how to talk well, about Well, it... it once again, I, I'm a firm believer in teamwork. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the, the Beatles and George Martin were the perfect team. Mm -hmm. uh, although there were the odd occasions when George wasn't around and it would just be the Beatles towards the end there. And that team worked. And some outsiders could come in, be it Norman, Jeff, myself, Glyn, Johns. Uh, with I'm with Bowie. I'm stopping you. It's been said by a lot of people here that he was. David Bowie's, um, um, oh gosh, uh, doesn't okay. old age suck? <laughs> George, um, who were we just talking about? George Martin. He was the he was oh, yes. David Bowie's George Martin. Well, that's, that was that was that. the quote from David. He said that on a yeah. BBC so, so radio. Isn't that cool? Uh, and I didn't like it when I first heard it. It, I oh, had to, it took me a while to to realize exactly what he meant by that, mm. but. Uh, it, it was the, the perfect team, the Spiders, especially Rano, Bowie, and myself. We, we all just knew fit. what we had to do, mm -hmm. and, and there was no real thinking about it. It just happened. Now, David had a fairly good idea of what he wanted the end product to be. Mm. The, one of my main tasks was always to try and keep ahead of him to make sure that we could do whatever it was that he might come up with next. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. he might suddenly decide he wants the Philharmonic Orchestra on the track, I have to make sure that we could do that if it, it came about. Uh, he didn't like being in the studio. He got very bored, so wanted to get out as fast as possible. So he never came to any of the mixes. Mm. And through that, from a, a totally technical aspect, I, I as the producer, wanted to change things as they went along. As there, were, there weren't the, 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 all of the hands on, because this is before right. automation, right. it's still, Hunky Dory, I think, was eight, tra uh, eight track bordering, uh, some of it was 16 tracks. So we, we finished up quite often with lots of things on the same track. And in a group situation, when they're all there, everyone would be reaching over and twisting knobs as you went through each part. Well, for, for David's stuff, more often than not, it was just me and a second engineer. Mm. So we couldn't do that kind of thing. So I finished up coming up with this thing. I would just mix the intro, get that, commit to it, move off, do the first verse, get that, edit it onto the, core, uh, the, the intro, make sure the, in the edit worked, then I'd do the first chorus. And I could change things as I went to make each thing sound different mm. and finish up with, with the, uh, the final mix. Now, that is total commitment. There's no form of recall. You can't go back to an earlier mix to yeah, see if something's it's, better. It's and I, I went through, I was, after the su uh, success of Bowie started, I decided to only engineer my own uh, productions. And I got a phone call from uh, a gentleman over in the States that had been working on a Blood, Sweat and Tears album, and he wanted me to mix it. And I said, no, sorry, I, I only engineer my own productions. And he said, oh, okay, comes back to me, phones up a couple of days later, and this goes on for a, a couple of weeks, and finally, I thought, the only way I'm going to get him out of my hair is just to ask for the most ridiculous amount of money, <laughs> and, and then he'll go. Yes. <laughs> He did. Yeah. And now, as it turns out, by American standards, it wasn't an awful lot of money, right. but, but by English, it was. Sure. Uh, so he comes over, and I make it very clear. This is the way I do things. It's in sections. You can't go back. Said, that's great. That's fine. I have no problems with it. We spend the first day. We get the first mix. He comes in the next, uh, the beginning of the next day. He says, can I hear one of the other mixes that we did of uh, the song that we'd done at first? No, we only did it in... Oh, we can't go back. It just... Couldn't comprehend it, yeah. but it, no, you you had to commit. So Ugh. that's why I'm always pushing for it. I'm, well, it's w would it be fair to say that David Boy of 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 all the various artists you've worked with came to the table with the widest range of influences of anyone? It seems like when I read about him, he liked a lot of different types of music. But they, and the Beatles did. Uh, yeah, that's Super true. Tramp did with. Uh, with someone like Supertramp, it was the band had all these different influences. It wasn't one particular person. Right. And it was probably similar with, with the Beatles. They, they, George having his Eastern influence, Paul more classical, uh, 
John not wanting to conform, uh, whatever those influences would have been. Uh, so no, they, they, they always seem to, if, if you're going to be original, you've got to take from lots of different places. That's one of the things that scares me today with regard to radio. It's so f formulated to, to one genre of music. Uh, if you want to hear heavy metal, you go to this particular station and all you hear is that. So the kids that are growing up, they're listening to only what they like to hear. And how far can you take that? If you, if you can add classical to hard rock, it, it may make something different, but they're never listening to the classical to be able to add to that. Yeah. So it's not going to grow. And it's the same in all the genres. England it scares had a, me. Had a, a tremendous advantage over us in that regard because you had BBC. And because radio, radio was so one. crappy. <laughs> we had no choice. But it, man, the, 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 the music that it produced from, 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 from that was just Just incredible. after the war. Just after the, it's the, the early baby boomers, it was amazing over there, the talent that's come out. It, it, I'm going to tease you a little bit. How uh, has getting bored easily made you a better mixer or a better engineer? Because you get bored pretty easily. Yeah. I, it, has that made you a better engineer? And how? Should I be getting bored more often to be as good as <laughs> yeah, you? I, I think, I think it's, it's made me better in as much as uh, I'm always trying to learn, but I think anyone would do that whether they get bored or not. It, it's, given, it's made me go from, from one type of music to another one. I, not keep, I hate, I couldn't stand working on the same kind of music day in, day out. Mm -hmm. I've, I've had to go from a pop album to Mahavishnu Orchestra to uh, something complete, just jumping around like mad. You know how there's a group of people in this world that try to find every flaw in the Bible? And considering that you're one of the great prophets of audio, <laughs> I've got a problem. I mean, the Trident A range is your favorite EQ, and your frequency that you hate the most is 200, mm -hmm. but you can't reach 200 with a Trident A range. It's, it's, How do you it's, do it's, this? it's just round. What is it? It's 240, 250. 250. That's close enough for me. Come on, Ken. What's up with that? <laughs> It, shouldn't you choose an EQ that, that you can, first of all, why do you hate 200? It never did anything know. to I, you. I, it, it's, I, <laughs> oh, but it does constantly. <laughs> I don't know. I've just, I, I just found, for me personally, if I roll it out there I, and add a bit lower down, I prefer the, the bass drum sound or the bass sound with that. I, all kidding aside, I get a lot of questions about how to make the kick drum work with the bass and, and get all the elements in the low end part of the spectrum mm -hmm. to work together, is that, could that be considered a secret of yours that you... I have no secrets. The, uh, a technique of yours that, <laughs> that somehow your, your lack of interest in 200 helps you get some of, the, some of all that working together? Maybe. I, I, Would I you do, take I do 200 everything out of a kick and a bass at the same yeah, time? Yes. I, I, I have been known to. I don't always. Or generally speaking, with the kick, I will do it. Sometimes with the bass, not always. But it, f for me, there are no hard and fast. I'm a creature of habit. Yes. That being said, there is. There's also no hard and fast rules. It, I, I do what comes naturally to me, and I'm. I'm I have seen engineers that. Uh, they try and keep everything secret. When they're in the midst of a mix, they'll cover all of their EQs up so no one can come <laughs> in and see it. And that's a, that to me is, is such bullshit because yeah, yeah. anyone can come and see what I'm doing at any time because as far as... <clears throat> It'll never be as, applicable as far as, again to anything else. Well, well, if you took 10 engineers and they all had exactly the same thing to start with, they'd all come up with something different because it's here and it's here mm -hmm. that it all comes from. And, mm -hmm. and that's it. So. Anyone can have my secrets any time they want them. Good luck to them. Uh, you did that inhale like something's supposed to happen here. Do batter's box is coming up after this next question. Oh, great. Um, I better make it a good one. Let me see what I got left, Herb. I was working at Abbey Road. Oh, yeah? I'm not saying how was oh, it. Oh, how was it? Just, Sorry, I thought you, you said so I thought he said I was working yes, at Abbey Road. Yes, that's what I thought. I, was, I, thought. I, I, Herb, I go there tomorrow. It, it, was, to, no, it, <laughs> it was the most amazing training anyone can possibly have, as mm. far as I'm concerned. They, it was a converted the, house? Yes. Mm. It was built eight, early 1800s, and then EMI took it over in 1930 and, and changed it into a studio mm -hmm. where we built everything, uh, built number one studio in the garden and all of that kind of thing. But just getting to work with, with basically six 
incredible engineers, three, three pop, three classical, getting to watch how, how they worked. I just you're in having to do just yeah, having to do mastering before you're mm. allowed to sit behind a board and create something that someone's wow. eventually going to have to put on vinyl. Amazing. And none of the uh, I was fired at one point from Abbey Road. I then got the, the gig back again, but the the guy that uh, took over as manager, a gentleman by the name of Alan Stagg, he wanted me out. He didn't. We'd had an argument over the Beatles and some requests that the Beatles made. He asked Ken Townsend, who was the head of the uh, engineering staff, maintenance staff there, to set up an electronics exam for me that he knew I'd fail. Well, Ken refused to do it because he was very, Ken had been there for donkey's years, and Ken knew that no engineer there was an electronics engineer. We were there purely as sound engineers mm. to listen and change that. We had no idea what went on within the board. We mm. didn't need to. And the training was such that we shouldn't know what goes on right. in there. Right. We had the guys upstairs to deal with it for right. us. Precisely. And they, they were all amazing. They covered our asses every day of the week. What a classic that doesn't count as my question. You asked it. So I have one <laughs> question left. Right okay. so um, <laughs> just uh, the way you use reverb, you think of it as a substitute sometimes for a 5.1 situation. You use it to control your front to I, rear I, depth. I, uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, is that just a, a question of how you apply it to get that sense of depth, or are you using pre delays, or is well, it just something you just it, do it, naturally? It's something I do naturally. It's, it's that's one of the things I've, I've noticed with modern recordings. The, uh, now we have digital with all the plugins. It, there'll be a different reverb on each thing, yeah. and it, I'm sure it all eventually just clouds up. That's. Uh -huh. We used to have one one plate or one chamber, and that was it for everything. And we had to work things around so that we could get what we wanted out of that one plate or that one chamber. Did you so, did you print like if you needed something different? Did you print the reverb on that track? No, not Personally. not often, not often. On occasion. Oh, this is the spot. This is the. This, this is, is it. Is that you preparing? You're warming up. You're in the in the in the bullpen. I for the think maybe. <laughs> I saw I have another question. Uh, no. <laughs> I can't wait for this because of all of, of all our guests, I, 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 Ken was like, don't tell me ahead of time what I'm going to do. I exactly. want it to be really spontaneous. This is going to be really spontaneous, and I think this is going to be a lot of fun. So our, our, our audience knows the setup. We don't need to go over that. But um, OK, let's, let's make it about EQs and or compressors, OK? Oh, Your choice. Boy. OK. okay. And, and if you can't think anything, just say, yeah, forget it. I don't like that one. Bad question. Bad, go, bad host. And, and those would be the ones Herb came up with. Yeah. Lead vocals. Fetch out. Uh, compressor. Back limiter. Fairchild's limiter out uh, uh, Abbey Road. It was a, we had Fairchild limiter and Alta compressor. But you also used them as DSers too. Yes. Uh, backgrounds. Pains in the asses. <laughs> Great answer. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Uh, acoustic guitar. C12. Oh, wow. Uh, acoustic piano. Now, this is supposed to be f uh, limiters or compressors, right? Uh, it's whatever you want it to oh, be. Okay. You're Ken Scott. It's your segment. Uh, okay, keep, keeping to that Altec compressor. Okay. What's the number of that compression? Oh, so, yeah, yeah. Two thirty or something? No, I can't remember. I can't either. No. Uh, Old age. Okay, I'm gonna make it hard on you. Synth strings, synthesizer strings, as opposed to live strings. Boring. <laughs> what What do you use to make them better, Ken? Real strings, whenever possible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, live bass. Live bass, DI. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, electric guitars. Let's let's say cleaner sounding electric guitars. It doesn't matter. It's the same for me on average. one. It's BU-67. Oh, OK. Cool. Uh, kick drums. Suspension, which won't mean a thing. Unless okay, you we'll get epic drums, then you'll see. Uh, <laughs> okay. No, I, I, some time ago, working on a Stanley Clark album, I found a way of suspending an RE-20 in the bass drum so that oh. both heads could be on. Okay. For Tony Williams to play because he was used to both heads being on. Uh, so. Tony Williams. Yeah. Snare. Sony C38. You compress your snares live? No, I never compress. Okay. If, if very little on drums. Okay. Overheads. Ribbons. 
Coles? Uh, Coles, yeah, all Bayer M160s I've used. Rooms, room light. Anything. No preference whatsoever. Just it's whatever just whatever's happens to be out there, and you turn it on and listen yeah. to it. Yeah. Okay, your stereo bus. SSL compressor. Cool. Man, great. It went pretty fast, huh? Yeah. Got time for another question now, have we? <laughs> <laughs> I got Actually, we're going to do this no. over to our guy Drew Adams in the corner office. Yeah, Drew, you got some questions for I our guests? chat room is running live, so he's been selecting questions oh, from the I chat see. room. Oh, I see. A lot of good oh, ones. Yeah. A lot of good questions. I'm going to start off with the Andrew. I'm sorry, Andrew Williams Spence's question. Uh, question for Ken. How much truth, the, truth is there in the stories of John Lennon hating his voice, and which of the Beatles was most adept in the studio, i.e., least annoying? Are you, being adept doesn't necessarily mean being less annoying. Uh, John hated his vocal. That's why he, he always wanted a single repeat tape echo on it, a uh, slap. Uh, all, all four of the Beatles could be pains in the asses or they could be great. So uh, it, that's a tough one to answer. I think one would have to say the most adept one as a musician covering all kinds of things would be Paul because he was great on bass, he was good on piano and good on guitar. Very cool. Uh, Very cool. Also, uh, from Jam Pot, in regards to recording the Beatles back in the USSR, yeah. I was wondering if, he could sh if you could shed uh, some light into how you took a comp of three drummers and made them sound like one take of one drummer. Sheer brilliance, what can I say? Absolutely. We did it till it worked. That, it's, that was the thing did we you, did. Did you do hard edits? Did you no, blend, no, it was, blend it was, the faders it was, there's, in? This was more of an overdub. And you, you, you can hear it. If you, if you listen carefully, knowing that there are the things, there, there are tom fills that occur at times when other things are going on. So it couldn't possibly be one drama. One more, Drew. Very cool. Okay, uh, from Pac-Man 829, uh, question for Ken. Looking back on your mixed career, how did the real thing compare to your vision slash dream of what you wanted to achieve? Uh, far, far beyond what I ever imagined. It's just been absolutely astounding. Uh, it's, no, I, it, yeah, wow. no comparison. <laughs> wow, it went so fast. That was yeah. an hour. You survived it, was it painless? Absolutely. God, we had such a, yeah. we're so honored. I had fun. Thank you so much. Oh. You know, I always ask everybody if you'll come back. And I would love to. Because we never can get, you'd have to come back ten times before we started to scratch the surface of your incredible. We could make a show out of any one of the questions I ask. So, you know so what I'm saying? It, it is a promise that we will love to have right. you back. And, and love to be back. That. Thank you so much. What do you think? Well, I mean, you know, this is this is why I do this. Yeah, absolutely. To be able to, to hang and talk with cats like Ken, it's uh it's just a blessing because uh, um, I'm either going to completely ruin the next 20 mixes I do from this information, <laughs> or I'm either going to go to another level. Right. And as my manager, it's your job to fix it well, and get us paid for both. You got it, leave. brother. I will. Listen, I'm inspired <laughs> to try to reach those things by this 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 company. No question, man. Uh, I guess I guess uh, in wrapping this up, we should kind of take the tone a little bit more serious uh, um, to a little more serious note at this point. Um, yeah, you want me to do it? Yeah. yeah. We lost a, uh, a giant this week who happened to be a friend. Um, you know, sometimes when you're lucky enough, like Ken's career and Dave's career and my, my career, you, and, and your career, which, which you'll get to, there are moments that you remember. The first time you hear your record on the radio, or the first time a great guy calls you, or producer, a and guy, or label first chief, or artist. First time you get laid in the studio is always high. Mm -hmm. um, what happened to me? <laughs> you can see how serious we are. So, so one of the things when you were a young manager was to get your act on Soul Train. Um, and mostly because Don Cornelius was such a demanding guy, a lot of people wouldn't know, that it wasn't about you having a hit record. If your publicity person wasn't on point, he was going to read you. If your management wasn't on point, he was going to read you. He had very exacting standards, very hard set to get onto, and usually propelled things forward. Switching gears as an innovator, you're talking about somebody who brought cultural change and business change to television. What people try to do in television today by owning their content and syndicating, virtually unheard of, very few people to get there. When he did it, when he did it, it was unfathomable for somebody to be able to do that. It's hard to quantify that kind of stuff till Absolutely. you see it. And, 
And then beyond that, just as a personal point of preference, he just was always so cool to me. He really, I, look, I, I managed a prodigious talent, so that was part of it. It's not all me. But he loved the fact that you had standards and that you brought intellect to it in class. So for 20 years, he was just really cool. His son, Tony, is a friend of mine. He's another class guy. So we lost one, and yeah. we just won it. That, that, that hit me hard, Herb. I wasn't going to say anything, but I got images, images in my brain from watching that show that will just never go away. Some yeah. of the dancers, I'm not going to go into individual ones, but just the images he created and that voice, that yeah. voice and, and the, the, the presence that he commanded and, and the doors he opened. And Amazing. And when you sat at, the, at his knee and he gave you a passing grade, it inspired you like... Ken would inspire you, other people inspire you. So why, you know, is it, why is it that once we don't understand some people's greatness until they're gone, you know? It's just such a sad thing. You sometimes know? retrospective is where you get perspective. Yeah. Um, we're losing, so you know what? We're losing too many of the good ones. Let's wrap it up by saying in passing, we wish you love, peace, and soul. Bye-bye.